I'm here to talk about technology. What effect does technology have on the overall culture? I would start with the population of the world which has been growing, technology has been kind of evolving with that as well. In 1900, less than 2% of people were actually exposed to technologies. In about 1950, I would say roughly 5%. And in 2000, more than 15%. And today, almost 3 billion people are exposed not just to technologies, but smart technologies, evolved technologies. And technologies which can connect us, which can enable us to do a lot of things. And if I take an example of, let's say, a technology like internet. Now from 1994 to today, let's say to 2014, it grew from 0.4% of internet users to about 40%. That's a huge lift in terms of number of users. Now if you look at how technology has been evolving, now this gentleman, Mark Zuckerberg, most of us know him. He's watching us, big brother. He plans to connect the entire world, almost 100% of the world, in the near future using internet and connect all of us together. What impact does it have on our culture? How does it affect us? Well, there is something called diffusion of innovation, a theory which was developed in 1962 by Rogers who defined this very interesting bell curve of how technologies are started, they are triggered, and how they start to become part of the culture or lifestyle. Now if you look at this bell curve, it has these five stages. So we start with the innovators, which is about 2.5%. So when a technology is triggered or started, it is actually adopted by the innovators, by the people who, want, who are quick to adapt to technologies, and it slowly moves on to the early adopters. Once people start to adopt technologies, it starts to move on, there is a little chasm in between. It's a very, it's a thing that one technology has to cross over that and kind of lead to the early majority and followed by the 34% or late majority and the last laggards, the last 16%, who are usually the last ones to adopt to a technology. Now most of us think that we are adopted to all sorts of technologies, but if you look at some of the common technologies out there, if you look at something like a Gmail, which pretty much all of us use, it would be surprising to know if someone doesn't use email through Gmail, it is at the late majority. And the next one, which is quite, quite one of my favorites, is the compact disk. Most of us may not know of compact disks now, because the technology is already obsolete. That is the pace at which technology has been evolving. And that's the interesting one, television and newspaper. That is the only technology that I can map in this one, which has actually gone till the laggards as well. Most of us are using all of that now. Now what, what takes the technology to trigger to move from one point to the other? Well, there are many factors to that. And the effect of culture clearly you can see, there's Danny using a virtual reality kit. That is the difference between the trigger point and the laggards. What's something we can relate to in today's Asian day? I think most of us are using Ubers, Olas, and we you know all sorts of applications to let's say call a taxi or a cab. This technology, not very old, is just 10 years old technology. Uber was started in 2009. It's very surprising. We're sitting in 2019 now. And this technology has actually evolved and gone into every strata of the society right now. That is the extent to which technology has permeated and we have started to adopt to that. Now what do I do? Coming to that, so I'm a design technologist and an architect. But before I get to what I do, I'd like to quote Simon Sinek here, which many of us know as a very inspiring person, a motivator speaker. So in one of his TEDx talks, he actually talks about this theory of the golden circle which is what, how, and why. So he gives the example of, of Steve Jobs and Apple, because many of us can relate to, I'm sure the Android guys would relate to that as well. Uh, so what he says about that is that most of the innovators, most of the leaders, most of the forward thinkers, most of the change makers, they think slightly differently. In, in fact, they think exactly opposite of the way how we all think. Most of us, more than 95% I would say, think outward in. We think of the what, we think of the how, and then we, some of us think of the why as well. 
What do we do? How do we do it? And why do we do it? Trust me, many of us don't even know why we are doing what we are doing. And these innovators think differently. They think exactly the opposite. They start from the why. And let me give you an example, and which is something which science and excites in this talk as well, about Steve Jobs. Let's say if Apple was to sell computers in a different manner, and they were to think with the what, why, uh, what, how, and why, how would a marketing campaign of Apple would look like or would sound like? Okay, what? Let's say we make computers. We make very good computers. How? We make computers which are simple to use, easy to use, elegantly designed. And why? Because you want to change the world. It may not be that convincing, right? But if you flip this the other way, and that is exactly how Apple markets and campaigns, they think, talk, communicate, and act exactly the opposite way. We want to change, challenge the status quo. We want to change the world using technology. That's the why. How do we do it? We apply that in making elegantly designed computers, easy to use by everyone. And what? We make computers. You want to buy one? That becomes a selling campaign. And that's exactly how they think, they act, and they communicate. Now, in terms of my life, let's say, why am I interested to talk about this? Let's say this is what architecture used to be in 1950s, let's say, when people were drafting. We had the tools of drafting, we were drawing things, we were designing things using the tools that were available at that time. Later on, let's say about 2000, year 2000, we had computers in place, which we were using that. We were using computers to design for stuff. We were using computers to design buildings, cities, and all sorts of things. Today, 20 years from then, we have latest technologies. We are using what we call a computational design. We start to use computers to an extent of using computer science and coding and algorithms and use that to design buildings, objects, cities, and solve the, try to solve the problems. And the future is bright as well. We are looking at augmented reality, virtual reality, and all sorts of things. But are we adapting to that as designers, as people who are users of that? In fact, if I talk about architecture, this is exactly how I feel right now. And this is exactly how most of us would think if we are actually into any profession. At the stone age man trying to use the tools, trying to still figure out what we can do because the tools are moving faster than we can imagine and we can process. Last year I wrote this article and I titled this Why Architects Hate Technology. It was more of a, a little sarcasm involved in that, but how I inferred it and how I analyzed it understanding the pace of the movement of technology and architecture and design of various fields was that we hate technology because it makes us feel outdated. We are too slow to adapt to certain things. At one point when we are adapting to, when Bhavan is adapting to using a smartphone, we are still a little slow. But why is that happening? I think it's the premise lies in the whole definition of technology. We confuse technology with only apps, gadgets, digital technologies. I think technology, if you look down into the etymology of technology, technology actually means the technique of doing something, the act of doing something. Even if I don't have a digital tool, for example, and I'm using, let's say, a drafting board to draw something, I'm still using a technique. That's my technology. But if we keep moving forward from there, so this is pretty much what I do now. But I won't expand on the what part of it, I'll start with the how. So we started this firm called RAT Lab, where RAT stands for Research and Architecture and Technology, and we're a design studio, we started in London 2012. And the reason why we started, starting from our why and the primary reason, was essentially we wanted to bridge the gap between design and technology. And that was the only primary aim that we had. That how do we bridge the gap between design and technology? We see a lot of designers, a lot of things happening around the world. Cities are growing, we're adding smart cities, we're adding new kind of buildings, new kind of objects. Are we using technology in the right way? We thought probably not. So that's the gap which we wanted to bridge. And that, with that sole purpose of why, we are still trying to do what we are doing. 
And moving on from there, looking at the second circle, the outside one, which is the how. How do we do this? How do we bridge the gap between design and technology? So what essentially we understood was, there's another third aspect involved. When we deeply look into the intersections of design and technology, we can start to take inspiration from nature. Because nature has rules, nature has rules to efficiently design, perform and function in an elegant manner. And that's something that most of us learn from as well. And the intersections of which is where we kind of operate at. And when I talk about the connect between technology and nature, I have to say this one thing that we as human beings, we tend to get inspired by nature. We tend to get, uh, you know, like overwhelmed by nature using two aspects. One is our limited conscious knowledge and second is the unlimited subconscious being because we are all a part of nature. So we tend to take inspiration from that. But what does nature teach us? Very interesting mathematical patterns, let's say hidden algorithms. That's a broccoli showing the Fibonacci pattern, which is a mathematical pattern which is not designed in a particular manner, but it just happens to be like that. And we can start to decode that. If you look at a nautilus spiral, it shows a Fibonacci spiral. That is a perfect golden section, a mathematical curve, has its own beauty and elegance. This, which is a mathematical Voronoi pattern operating as wings of a dragonfly, shell of a tortoise, skin of a leaf, and in many other forms as well. What this teaches us is scalability. That is one thing which we try to adapt from nature is scalability. That nature can allow to scale things. So how do we do it? We create tools which allow us to predict the design and how it's going to behave or perform at a small scale, at a large scale, urban level, city level, at any scale pretty much. We use like sophisticated technologies in today's Asian day where we can understand this is a project where we were trying to predict how rain would fall on a highly contoured site very close to Shimla which we were designing. Now that was very interesting because we could actually predict the behavior of how water is going to flow on a very very complex site and understand how the vegetation has to take place, how the drainage system has to be designed and pretty much all sorts of problems which would ideally arise after actually building it and putting all our resources and money into that. Or even tools like these. These are tools created by, by my students who are using technologies in various ways. Tools, tools like these are very, very futuristic. They can actually track your hand, take that motion into a design space, and you can actually control the space. And that is not the future. That is today. That is all happening today. But what's happening? Now, what are we doing? Coming to the third and the outermost circle, is we're trying to use scalability, which we kind of learn from nature, in various ways. So we are deploying technology at small scale, medium scale, large and extra large. We are actually deploying that in various products, installations, facades, buildings, cities. And we work with different architects, designers, creative people from different disciplines and collaborate with them to actually take the idea forward using technology. We use that to create spaces like these. Interior spaces where we use faceting and the mathematics of subdivision to, to devise an interior space. And I'm just showing you the look and feel of these kind of spaces. These are cost effective, quickly built spaces where technology plays a pivotal role. When I talk about scalability, we work with designers from other disciplines as well. So we did this collaboration with a Greek designer when we started the company initially where we were trying to use technology and design to actually design a fabric or a texture of a fabric. So it's a collaboration between an architect and a fashion designer to create something which otherwise couldn't have been imagined through using technology. Large scale buildings, this is a project in Tokyo which we are a part of where we use physics engine and simulations to design the space and design that forward to make it buildable. Building facades like these. But what we do is in this kind of situation, we actually predict technology by using deploying technologies such as let's say 3D printing to understand the buildability of something, for example. And how we can use that to understand and predict something before it's actually built. 
So that is the true meaning of deploying technologies. In India, we often think that technology is not for India. But the culture is changing. This is a religious space. It's going to be a temple in South India, which we are working on, using technology. A very sacred space, and we are actually analyzing based on the time of the rituals that happen, understanding how the behavior of the building would be when there are 4,000 people in a space versus 100 people in a space. How would the cooling nodes get affected? How will the light come in? And for a similar brand in Mumbai as well, where all of these are using technology in various ways. This is another religious space, a mosque designed in Dubai, which is a proposal. But how do we change things? How do we affect culture? How does one change culture? What we are doing as an organization is working with professionals of various kinds and trying to change the approach of working. But that's a slow process. That's a top-down approach. We also take a bottom-up approach where we educate. So I also run an educational cell, which is like an independent school in itself. And we carry out workshops and programs across India for design students. These are the people who are going to be the future of India and in the global map as well. And we teach them how to inculcate technologies, how to use them in the early stages of design and their learning paths. To build stuff, build installations, understand technology and deploy that in various ways. Few years back, I was the editor for H2O, which is an international uh, digital magazine for architecture. And I wrote this article called Create Your Tools First. That is something I truly believe in. That you've got to create your tools first and start to deploy that into design. And I also happen to be a follower of a lot of sci-fi movies. I don't know how many of you know of this movie. Anybody knows of Limitless? Yeah? Okay, so very interesting movie, which also talks about that we are limited to a particular percentage, maybe 10 to 15% of a brain. On a TEDx talk, I'm not here to talk about how drugs can actually make you use 100% of the brain. But what I'm trying to say is, this is science fiction, that what if we could access 100% of our brain and mental capacity and use that to create something? I feel exactly the same way when I use technology, which enables designers to access 100% of the design spectrum to create something and solve complex problems. Where are we today? in terms of using technology, computer science, algorithms, mathematics, in architecture, we are still here. We are still at the early innovator stage. So it is actually the top 2.5% who are pushing the game for the entire commune to change. And to innovate, you have to bring about a change, you have to get out of your comfort zone and start to make a change happen. And I would, end, I would end the talk and leave you with that note that before you start to figure out what you do and how you do it, always start with a why. Thank you very much.